Greetings, everyone. Welcome to spir Spiraling Out of Control on the Fate of Capital and Capitalism in the 21st Century, a conversation between Nancy Fraser and David Harvey. This event is organized to celebrate the occasion of the 150th anniversary of the publication of Marx's Capital. Uh, my name is Mary Taylor. I'm the assistant director at the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics, and we're happy to be co-sponsoring this event with Jacobin Magazine. Um, I want to let you know that if you'd like to find out about more events like this uh, at the center, you can go to pcp.gc.cuny.edu to find out more about our events. You can sign up on the on the web page to receive our newsletter, if you'd like. I also want to let you know that we are recording this event tonight, uh, so please speak clearly into the microphone if you choose to ask a question so that it will be recorded for posterity. Um, once again, we're very happy to have you here, thanks to Jacobin Magazine. And I'd like to introduce Bhaskar Sunkara, who is the founding editor and publisher of Jacobin, as well as the publisher of Catalyst, a journal of theory and strategy. Bhaskar? Uh, yep. Thank you all for, for being here. Um, I was really excited to moderate uh, this event, particularly because I'm a notoriously over-involved moderator most of the time. Um, I'm like um, puffy on a biggie track. You know, I'm always there mumbling in the background, whispering, you know, um, just, just really distracting the audience. But, but this time I'm in, you know, such illustrious company, you know, I'm just gonna shut up and have a very easy, easy job. Um, so obviously the first volume of, of um, Marx's Capital was published 150 years ago this year. Um, it's a difficult book, um, made a little bit easier with Professor Harvey's work, but um, one that's fresh and, and alive. It draws on a rich literary history from Shakespeare to Shelley to, to Balzac. Um, it's really rewarding. Um, but for all those literary flourishes, it's a contribution um, you know, that, that really is significant for rooting and grounding uh, socialist ideas um, in the study of, of political economy, because we can't speak of capital without talking about uh, socialism. And for socialists, there can be nothing more vital than understanding how uh, the labor process, the production and distribution of goods, and the accumulation of surplus functions. Uh, that's why this recent kind of return to Marx, uh, more broadly the return to, to capital um, in particular, um, as opposed to just, um, you know, 1844 manuscripts and other um, you know, still worthwhile works, of course, um, is so, um, so promising. Um, so uh, today, uh, David Harvey and Nancy Frazier will be discussing their recent work, um, as well as uh, responding to each other on the occasion of the anniversary. Uh, then hopefully at the end, we'll still have some time for, um, for questions from the, from the audience. Um, Nancy Frazier um, is a professor at the New School for Social Research and the holder of an international research chair at the College of Global Studies in, um, in Paris. I considered trying to pronounce it in the original uh, French, but uh, luckily <laughs> I did not do that. Um, trained as a philosopher at CUNY, she specializes in critical social theory and political philosophy. Her new book, Capitalism, A Conversation in Critical Theory will be published by Polity Press in spring. Um, and you know, she has, throughout her work, theorized capitalism's relation to democracy, racial oppression, and social reproduction, ecological crisis, and feminist movements in a series of, of essays. Uh, there's been a bunch in New Left Review recently, as well as uh, critical um, history, historical studies. Um, and also recently in the Verso published book, Fortunes of Feminism from State-Managed Capitalism to Neoliberal um, Crisis. Um, uh, Nancy's work has been translated into more than 20 languages and actually twice cited by the Brazilian Supreme Court. That's like a little, little, bit, little bit of trivia. Earlier um, Supreme Court. Yes, right, right. <laughs> uh, not, not as a pretext to, uh, to oust uh, uh, the PT. Um, she's currently uh, president of the American Philosophical Association Eastern Division and Roth Family Distinguished Visiting Scholar at Dartmouth College. 
Um, David Harvey is a distinguished professor of anthropology and geography at CUNY and author of various books, articles, and lectures. He's the author most recently, oh, not most recently, but he's the author of um, 17 Contradictions and the End of Capitalism, uh, which was one of The Guardian's best books in 2011, The Enigma of Capital and the Crisis of Capitalism. Other books include uh, Companion to Marxist Capital and my personal favorite, uh, Limits to Capital. Um, and um, uh, Professor Harvey has been teaching Karl Marx's Capital for nearly 40 years. I'm sure many of us in the room um, got through uh, Capital with the help of his uh, lectures and his, there's videos of them, um, if you're interested, that are uh, available on his um, website. And his new book, uh, published by Oxford University Press, which is actually going to be available uh, tonight, um, is called Marx, Capital, and the Madness of Economic Reason. And I guess we'll start off with a uh, contribution from, from Nancy. Thank you very much, uh, Bhaskar, and thank you, Mary Taylor, for organizing this, and David for suggesting the idea. Um, I want to say, because um, I don't think the, um, the letters are big enough, that my book is actually co-authored with Rahel Yegi, who is sitting here in the audience, and um, it has the form of a dialogue about how to think about capitalism and a critical theory of capitalism. The, what I'm going to say tonight represents my own views, but I'm only one voice in another dialogue. So to, to hear Rahul Yegi's views, you'll have to read the book. I do see from uh, the juxtaposition that our cover is, is not as gripping. I think maybe we should go, <laughs> go back to the drawing room on that. The book is not out yet, um, so maybe we could even you change that. You do it again. What? You could have Ramika do it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good, yeah. Um, I, I, it is nice to, to be here at CUNY because I did get my PhD here um, in the philosophy department, and I think this might be the first or maybe the second time I've been invited back since then. I wasn't invited by the philosophy department, we should say. <laughs> um, I also wanted to mention, uh, I don't know if David uh, remembers, um, but I too um, cut my teeth uh, on Das Kapital with you, David, in a study group in Baltimore in the late 60s in my Trotskyist days. <laughs> so, okay, uh, here we are, full circle. Now, the title of this event is Spiraling Out of Control on the Fate of Capital and Capitalism in the 21st Century. I read this title as a highly compressed and very evocative diagnosis of our current situation. I read the first part, Spiraling Out of Control, as referring to the concept of crisis and the second part as specifying the object of the crisis as capitalism, or perhaps the current form of capitalism uh, that we're living with in the 21st century, neoliberal, globalizing, financialized capitalism. Either way, as I read our title, we are here to discuss the present crisis of capitalism. And I should say at the outset that I am fully persuaded that there is such a crisis, that it is a crisis of capitalism. And so I'm 100% behind uh, the proposal, if that's what it was, to make this the agenda for the discussion. Now, as I see it, everything turns on how we interpret the two major concepts that together make up this topic, namely the concept of crisis and the concept of capitalism. So in my initial statement here, I want to try to clarify those concepts, and I'm going to do so in a way um, that might be slightly uh, provocative, aimed at sharpening what might turn out to be dis differences or disagreements between the two of us for the sake of a lively discussion. So um, I want to suggest that there are at least two possible ways of interpreting the concepts of crisis and of capitalism. One set of interpretations is relatively narrow while the other is quite broad. I'm going to use my time in this initial round to present these alternatives and to argue in favor of the second broader interpretation. 
So I'm going to be making the case for what I'm going to call an expanded conception of capitalism and an expanded conception of capitalist crisis. I'll try to suggest in closing that these conceptions equip us to clarify the sense in which our current, our, our present situation really is aptly described as a crisis of capitalism and that they might help us as well to envision a response to this crisis that can put us on a path to an emancipatory resolution. So I'm going to begin with the concept of capitalism. Often, capitalism is understood narrowly as an economic system. I don't just mean by bourgeois economists of the classical and neoclassical schools. Even many Marxists have subscribed to some version or another of the narrow definition. It's true, of course, that they follow Marx in penetrating beneath the bourgeois perspective of commodity exchange on the market to the more fundamental level of commodity production. And it's there, of course, again, following Marx, that they discover the secret of accumulation in capital's exploitation of wage labor. Wage laborers who are, of course, recompensed only for the socially necessary costs of their own reproduction, while the surplus value their labor generates goes instead to the capitalists. So in the traditional Marxist view, as I'll call it, this exploitative process is the crux of the capitalist system. It's the source of capital's otherwise mysterious capacity to self-expand. It's not really self-expansion at all. This capacity is thought to reside primarily in the relation between two classes. On the one hand, the capitalists who own the society's means of production and who appropriate its surplus. On the other, the free but propertyless producers who have to sell their labor power piecemeal in order to live. Capitalism on this view is a system of class domination. But class domination as interpreted here is at bottom a relation located in the capitalist economy and denominated as it were in value, this economic category. Now, I want to say that this traditional Marxist view, as I'm calling it, is a huge improvement over that of the dismal scientists who populate the economics departments of nearly all our universities, my own being a welcome exception. Its account of exploitation and class domination is spot on in identifying some of the most fateful and important forces that drive developments in capitalist societies and it offers a genuinely critical perspective on those forces. Unlike the ideologues who see nothing amiss in these arrangements, those who subscribe to the Marxian view of capitalism as an economic system centered on working class exploitation see that system not only as unjust, but also as inherently crisis prone. In their view, Capitalism's orientation to limitless accumulation through the exploitation of wage labor tends over time to raise the organic composition of capital, exerting downward pressure on the rate of profit, intensifying competition, and encouraging financial speculation, all developments that lead periodically to economic crises. Leaving the details of that complicated argument aside, we can say that for traditional Marxism, capitalist crisis has its roots in an economic system that harbors mutually contradictory imperatives within itself and that is expressed, the crisis is expressed economically. Now again, I take it as a given that these accounts of capitalism and capitalist crisis are genuinely insightful, that they have actual critical purpose purchase on social reality. But I nevertheless consider them narrow, too narrow, in fact, to clarify the actual crisis of capitalism we are living through now. 
The problem is that the traditional view focuses overwhelmingly on social processes and social relations that are accorded value in capitalist society. Whether we are talking about production, circulation, or distribution, the relations in question are situated within the precincts that capitalist society itself defines as economic. And the processes involve activity that capital itself considers to have economic value. Now, this is, as I say, a restricted view of capitalism, and it brings with it a restricted view of capitalist crisis. The view of crisis, too, is focused on contradictions internal to the capitalist economy. What generates crisis on this view, again, are the internal dynamics of the economic system, which harbors a built-in tendency to self-destabilization. The principal expression of capitalist crisis is likewise economic. Mar market crashes, bankruptcy chains, bursting of speculative bubbles, runs on currency, depressions, widespread cessation of production, and mass unemployment. Now, to see why I'm calling the, these conceptions narrow, consider that they leave out a broad swath of social relations and social processes which are officially defined as non-economic, but which nevertheless supply the indispensable background preconditions for a capitalist economy. I'm thinking, for example, of the unwaged activities of social reproduction, which assure the supply of labor of, uh, for economic production, while also creating, maintaining the social bonds, solidarities, and forms of trust that can sustain capitalist society more generally. The capitalist economy literally could not function without these activities, even though it has historically accorded them little or no monetized value and often does not pay for them even today. The same is true for the apparatuses of public power, law, police, regulatory agencies, and steering capacities that supply the order, predictability, and infrastructure that are necessary for sustained accumulation. These, too, are indispensable to capitalist commerce, even though capital is happy to squeeze them to the breaking point whenever it can. Equally necessary to the capitalist economy is a relatively sustainable organization of our metabolic interaction with the rest of nature. Not to mention, uh, uh, sorry, one that ensures essential supplies of energy and raw materials for commodity production, not to mention a habitable planet that can support life. Absent this ecological condition, capital accumulation would grind to a halt. Now, what I mean by an expanded view of capitalism is one that includes these background conditions as well as the foreground economic system they undergird. The central conceptual move that I'm making here is quite similar to the one that Marx made in volume one of Capital. There, he viewed exploitative production as a hidden abode beneath market exchange, an abode that harbors the dirty secret of exploitation, namely to repeat that workers are paid only the average socially necessary costs of their reproduction and no more. In the same spirit, the expanded view treats social reproduction, public power, and historical nature as additional abodes, but more hidden still, abodes that lie beneath the sphere of production and contain even dirtier secrets, namely that capital free rides on them, expropriating productive inputs and conditions of production for who, whose reproduction it does not pay, unlike labor, or does not anywhere near fully pay. So this is a, a form of expropriation, if you like, that lies beneath exploitation and renders it possible. On this expanded view, capitalism is no mere economic system, but an institutionalized social order, on a par, for example, with feudalism. 
It is built on a distinctive set of institutional divisions. First, the separation of economic production from social reproduction, which as you know, corresponds to the division between wage work performed largely by men, at least historically, and unpaid work performed uh, overwhelmingly still today by women. Second, uh, there's the separation of the economic from the political, which corresponds to the division between public and private power, as well as to the division between core and periphery. And finally, there's the separation of human society from non-human nature, which pre-existed capitalism, of course, but was vastly sharpened and intensified by it. I'm claiming that these institutional separations are specific to and constitutive of capitalist society. They are elements of its DNA. And as such, they are historically fateful, if not simply perverse. Capitalist societies separate their economies from the, large, uh, from the, the, the latter's indispensable conditions of possibility setting their economies loose to disregard their own conditions of possibility and even at times to destroy them. In effect, in capitalist societies, official economies are dependent on processes and social relations whose value they disavow. This peculiar relationship of separation cum dependence cum disavow is, I think, a built-in source of potential instability or crisis. On the one hand, capital accumulation is not self-sustaining, but relies on social reproduction, public power, and various historical natures. On the other hand, its drive to unlimited accumulation threatens to destabilize the very processes and capacities that capital itself, not to mention the rest of us, need. The effect over time can be to jeopardize the necessary background conditions of the capitalist economy. Capitalist society, in other words, is primed to eat its own tail. So here we're talking about crisis, not just economic crisis, but also social reproductive crisis, political crisis, and ecological crisis. On the expanded view of capitalism, these non-economic dysfunctions are not accidental but systemic. They arise from contradictions in the deep structure of capitalist society, just like the economic dysfunctions that were theorized in the narrower view. So the expanded view of capitalism brings with it an expanded view of capitalist crisis. In these cases, however, the contradictions are not located inside the capitalist economy, but at the borders that simultaneously separate and connect production and reproduction, economy and polity, human society, and non-human nature. The contradictions are internal neither to the economy nor to any one social sphere, but arise rather between the constitutive elements of the society. I think of them sometimes as Polanyian crisis tendencies as opposed to Marxian crisis tendencies, but that's a useful uh, way of thinking only if you are very clear that they are not alternatives. Neither one is a replacement for the other. In this expanded view of capitalism, both sorts of crisis tendencies are fundamental, and I think therefore that two Karls are better than one. Now, the expanded view has many advantages, I think. Eschewing economism, it casts ecological degradation, social dislocation, and de-democratization as non-accidental expressions of deep-seated contradictions. No longer epiphenomenal expressions of real economic dysfunctions, they simply are, in and of themselves, systemic dimensions of capitalist crisis. How am I doing on time? Leslie? You're fine. Five, five minutes? Five, five oh. six minutes left. Okay, good. So, um, because capitalism separates commodity production uh, based on wage work from social reproduction based largely on unpaid labor, especially of women, and because it makes the first depend on the second, 
while simultaneously disavowing the, the, second, the value of the second, capitalism periodically destabilizes social reproduction. Throughout its history, we see a, uh, a periodic outbreak of crises of social reproduction and periodic efforts to restructure capitalism so as to defuse and mitigate, if not fully overcome, those crises of social reproduction. Similarly, capitalism separates the economic from the political, even as it also makes the economic free ride on the political, and, and as it periodically hollows out the very public powers that secure the possibility of private appropriation of surplus value. So periodically, too, in the course of capitalism's history, we have tremendous political crises, both at the national level and geopolitically and internationally, including, of course, struggles around imperialism and colonial rule. This is a, an absolutely endemic uh, part of uh, capitalist history and the spur often to, again, periodic attempts to remake capitalism so as to better uh, defuse or mitigate uh, the political dimension of its crisis. And finally, um, all of what I've just said applies as well to the fact that capitalism's institutionalized imperative to limitless accumulation combines with its construction of nature as humanity's other to ensure that nature is instrumentalized and cannibalized in ways that periodically imperil it. And so we can see, too, throughout capitalism's history, periodic outbreaks of ecological crisis that give rise to efforts to restructure capitalism in a way uh, so as to um, find an, uh, new uh, historical natures and new ways of organizing its relation to nature. So let me just say that nothing I've said here in any way refutes Marx or the economic crisis story that Marxists tell. The presence of the inter-realm contradictions I've been discussing does not at all disprove the idea that capitalism's economic subsystem also harbors internal contradictions. That idea captures an important feature of a social order that is subject to repeated economic depressions and financial crashes. What the expanded view does do, however, is resituate the narrow view in a broader frame. I don't know if I dare read this next clause. Much like Einstein resituated Newton. That's a bit, a bit grandiose. Uh, all right. <laughs> in any way, um, in any case, this expanded view does clarify why social conflict in capitalist societies has repeatedly assumed the guise of struggles over nature, social reproduction, imperialism, democracy, um, as well as over various um, uh, labor, debt, and other economic issues. The expanded view invites us to conceive these struggles as what I've called boundary struggles, which concern the existence, location, and character of the boundaries separating economy from polity, production from reproduction, human society from non-human nature. These boundaries mark the institutional separations I mentioned earlier, but they are not given once and for all. On the contrary, social actors, social movements have repeatedly mobilized around these boundaries, seeking to relocate, contest, or defend them, especially in periods of crisis, and sometimes they've actually succeeded in redrawing them. Social democracy, for example, uh, significantly redrew some of the boundaries I've mentioned. Struggles over where, whether, and how to divide states from markets, families from factories, and society from nature are as fundamental to capitalist society, as deeply grounded in its institutional structure as is contestation over the rate of exploitation or the distribution of surplus value. Examples include today struggles over clean water, housing, fishing rights, and childcare, among many, many others. Exceeding the problematic 
of economic distribution in, or the organization of labor. These are struggles over the grammar of capitalist life. Contra-economistic Marxism, which may or may not be the Marxism of Marx, these are neither secondary contradictions nor epiphenomenal expressions of economic realities. But again, it would be a mistake to think of boundary struggles as replacing class struggles. Class struggles remain endemic, indeed central to capitalist society. And it would be folly to jettison that idea just because the front lines of labor militancy are now to be found in Guangzhou as opposed to in Manchester or Detroit. Here too, fortunately, there's no obstacle to incorporating the narrow view of capitalist conflict within the broader view. The two ideas are complementary, not antithetical. So here too, in other words, two Karls are better than one. Just about finished. The expanded view has one additional advantage. It offers the chance to integrate Marxist theory with the best insights of feminism, post-colonialism, critical race theory, and political ecology. It allows us to bring all these resources to bear along with Marxian motifs in a critique of the forms of structural crisis and social struggle we experience now in the financialized capitalism of the present era. That crisis is multifaceted, encompassing not only economic and financial strands, but also ecological, political, and social reproductive strands. It cannot be adequately understood by means of an economistic critical theory. However, the various strands of the present crisis do not form a dispersed plurality. On the contrary, they are interconnected and they share a common source. All are grounded in the deep structure of contemporary capitalism, which, as I said, is globalizing, neoliberal, and financialized. A critical theory of contemporary crisis must be a theory of capitalism, especially of financialized capitalism, but one that avoids any hint of reductive economism. Instead of conceiving capitalism narrowly as an economic system, such a theory must conceive it broadly as an institutionalized social order. Only such an expanded view can do justice to a crisis that is at one and the same time multidimensional and grounded in a single identifiable social formation. Thank you. I, 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 like, I like the Einstein reference. Um, you should have been more confident about it. This is scientific socialism. Um, uh, David will, uh, will speak, uh, speak next, I guess, for the lectern. Yeah, I, I don't usually do this, but uh, I just want to show a couple of images. But I want to thank uh, Nancy for responding so positively to uh, this possibility to have this discussion. I value it a lot. Um, I think that uh, we can put a lot of things together. And as you'll see, there are many areas of overlap, and there are some differences. But I'm old enough to have tremendous impatience with what we call the narcissism of small differences. So I hope that we won't get into little niggly things about, you know, anyway, I'm sure we won't. Um, and and uh, we go back long, long enough and that we can transcend a lot of that. Uh, in, the, in the book uh, that I've just done, I had two aims. One was to ask the question, what was Marx trying to do in writing Capital? And uh, the second question was, if we try to reconstruct what he was trying to do in writing uh, Capital, um, does that reconstruction help us understand uh, many of the dilemmas that we currently face? And I would want to say that, yes, uh, a good reading of Marx does illuminate a great deal, uh, but uh, we have to actually start to understand uh, Marx's Capital as a whole rather than as in bits and pieces. In this regard, <clears throat> what I did was to try to set up a way of thinking about the circulation of capital in general and to try to situate uh, the three volumes of capital in particular in relationship to it. And I'm now going to try and use this uh, technology, which I 
<laughs> Obviously, we'll not know how to, to use. Okay, Mary, Pastor, don't help. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm by default a Luddite. Uh, so, anyway, what, where, what, will I turn something off? Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I managed to turn it off. See, that's what I always do. <laughs> um, one of the things I, I want to point out about Marx, however, is this, that Marx uh, uh, didn't write a book on capitalism. In fact, you can read all the way through Marx and never find the word capitalism. He writes about capital. And I think this uh, distinction is important. Uh, and I think uh, because he was writing about just about capital, uh, he does indeed take a narrow path, very frequently excluding all kinds of things which should be looked at and should be thought about, but which uh, don't get uh, into the Marxist canon. The second thing is, I think it's important to understand that Marx never finished his project, and he was constantly changing his mind. So the temptation that exists always to say that Marx said, as if it, we definitively know what he was, had in mind, I think uh, we have to abandon that. Uh, even volume one, which was the one book that was published, uh, he was still tinkering with it, uh, with a French edition, which uh, I actually held in my hands two weeks ago, uh, of, of 1872, had all kinds of modifications of volume one, and so he frequently talked about the way he wished to actually bring back uh, volume one and start it all over again. So the idea that Marx had very settled views, I think, uh, is, is, is wrong. Nevertheless, there are many things that he, I think he explored and came up with, which I think, for me, are of critical importance. So the second, you see, I managed to screw these things up so fantastically that... Uh, that what he does. Um, so what, what I was uh, doing then was trying to pin together uh, some ideas about, uh, about the three volumes of capital. And what I wanted to do was to, was to create uh, a, uh, a picture, a visualization of exactly what he was doing. Okay. Okay. Now, my, my inspiration for this, being a geographer, was the water cycle, the hydrological cycle. This is a circulation process which goes through various metamorphoses uh, in which you start as a sort of liquid in the ocean and then evaporation turns it into gaseous kind of, and then it moves around and then it comes down in all kinds of different ways, multiple ways. Some of it gets lost underground and stays there for centuries. Some of it gets locked up in ice and snow. Some of it rushes back down into the ocean. Some of it gets... So this cycle is kind of a familiar... Uh, kind of understanding of a physical process, and I, it seemed to me that it would be possible, I think, to set up a, uh, a, a parallel uh, cycle which would. Let me do this. Yeah. Okay. This is the uh, the cycle that, that that I set up. Now, in order to understand this, um, you have to understand uh, the various pieces of the story. We start at the bottom with money capital. So a capitalist takes some money and decides they're going to use that money to make more money, and there are various ways in which you can do it. But the way that Marx is looking at industrial capital is the way the capitalist gets into uh, and the market and buys two kinds of commodities, labor power and means of production. Yeah, you can leave it. It's okay like that. <laughs> I'm fantastic with these things. I really. Uh, hey. Anyway, so so okay. You start at the you start with money capital, and you go into the marketplace and you buy two commodities: labor power and means of production. You put that labor power and means of production together with a given technology, and you produce another commodity. But you don't only produce commodity; you also produce a value. And Marx says you produce value and surplus value. 
uh, which is uh, the, what is being converted in the money form into the commodity form into the production apparatus. So uh, we get these uh, metamorphoses that Marx talks about, which ends up with a particular kind of commodity. And then the commodity is then taken into the market and sold, and it's realized uh, its value in money form. And that money form is then distributed in various forms. Some of it goes in wages, some of it goes in taxes, some of it goes in industrial profit, merchant profit, rent, and interest. Then some of that money over there cycles back as consumer effective demand, because all of those people who have been distributed to have to live. But some of it also turns around and comes back as reinvestment into the system. So you get a cycle like the, the water cycle. And this is what Marx describes uh, in, in Capital. Volume 1. But what is interesting is the way in which this uh, gets set up uh, against the background of other things, which is the things that concern Nancy very much in her presentation. But I also want, if you like, to deepen an understanding of this process. For example, Volume 1 of Capital deals only with the transition from money capital up until the point of realization. And then Marx assumes at the point of realization that everything exchanges at its value and I don't have to consider anything anymore. He also assumes there's no problem of distribution, so he doesn't consider that. So volume one simply deals with one part of this whole story. And there is in the English-speaking world a, 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 what I might call a slight disease in reading Marx, which is called volume one-itis which is that everybody reads volume one insofar as they read Capital. It's a wonderful book and it's an incredible kind of read and it's fantastic to, to spend time with it. Uh, and, and then they kind of say that's all there is. But actually, the question of realization is important because right at the end of the very first section of volume one of Capital, Marx says if you get to the point of realization and nobody wants, needs, and desires a commodity or nobody has a want, need, and desire backed by ability to pay, then there is no value. So that is the dialectical relation between production and realization that is the core of this whole thing. But Marx excludes that from volume one of Capital, uh, except in sort of little bits and pieces. I mean, in chapter three, he does talk about the fact that, you know, commodities are in love with money, uh, but the course of true love never did run smooth. But you, uh, you recognize the importance of the realization of value in money form, and that what lies behind that are, are consumers with wants, needs, and desires. And again, Marx talks in, uh, in very brief terms about the fact that wants, needs, and desires uh, have to be structured in a certain kind of way. And then you look at the history of capitalism and about the construction of wants, needs, and desires and the transformation of wants, needs, and desires. And they become absolutely critical. And this is something he mentions elsewhere. This become critical in redefining what the nature of a capitalist society is about the constant transformation of wants, needs, and desires, and the necessity of ma matching those transformations with the capacity to uh, absorb the commodities which are being produced. So there's a relationship between wants, needs, and desires, uh, con and consumer effective demand, and, and production. And Marx talks about the contradictory unity that has to exist within the circulation of capital between production and realization. So one of the problems that arises in capital is that realization is not very well looked at and, and, and Marx abandons it after a little while and says, well, as far as the theory of capital is concerned, I'm not really going to get into that too far. I'm going to say that the study of wants, needs, and desires is a problem for history, not for political economy. And I think Nancy's quite right to complain that this sometimes keeps things in too, far too narrow a view. Um, but the realization of value then is something which does, however, crop up in volume two of Capital. But interestingly, volume two of Capital uh, assumes all of the findings of volume one don't exist. So that suddenly you find yourself in a different kind of world. It's like looking at a different perspective. Uh, for instance, there's no technological change in, in volume two of Capital. Uh, and, and, and that means that uh, the, one of the most dynamic things you start to see in, in, in Volume 1 is the history of technological change. And, and, and also, uh, the realization is taken up as a kind of a, a very, very serious kind of, kind of problem, and he gets into the issue of how do you coordinate 
All these different commodities being produced into a, with different turnover times and working periods and so on, so that they all come together. How do you deal with the, the circulation of fixed capital? How do you deal with the fact that many consumer items last for many years? How do you deal with that? And he then says, well, I, uh, the only way you can deal with this is to introduce the credit system. But he then says, the credit system does not belong in volume one. And it doesn't belong in volume two. It belongs in volume three. So I'm not going to say any more about this until I've done all the work in volume three. So you suddenly see that the, actually the unity between volume two and volume three becomes very critically important. And you cannot complete the argument of volume two without going to volume three and then complicate it by going back into volume one. The same thing applies in the area of distribution. Volume three is basically about distribution. Of course, there are other things come in as well, but it's about distribution. And the distribution field is very complicated. All sorts of issues arise about rent and interest and merchant profit and industrial profit. And Marx asks the question, why do those different forms of capital have a, a role to play in a society that's dominated by industrial capital? And that then suddenly becomes the, the, one of the big questions. So the distribution field has a different, uh, a different story to it. Now, my argument here is that if you really want to understand Marx's concept of capital, not capitalism, capital, you've got to understand the unity of volume one, two, and three. Hardly anybody reads volume two because it's boring. Number three is kind of, you know, a mess. It's, a, it's, a, it's fascinating, but a mess. So it's very difficult to put this together, but you can see once you've got them this, that if you cannot put all three volumes together and understand about these, the, the relations between these, these volumes, then you're going to be in real difficulty. And, and, and like I say, this volume one-itis takes over and people go back to the theses of volume one and talk about that, which, which, which are perfectly okay in their own way. But to look at the assumptions. What Marx does again and again and again is to say, look, I'm going to build a, a model of how capital works. I'm interested in both writing a critique of classical political economy and showing the real source of profit and exploitation, all those kinds of things. But I'm also interested in defining the, rule, the laws of motion of capital, as he puts it. That is, uh, is there something going on in this kind of area where, where these laws of motion of capital can be defined? And here you will immediately find yourself in a different terrain uh, than you're in when you're looking at the water cycle. Because this system has to expand. It's not a cycle. Marx, again and again in the Grundrisse, says it's a spiral. And it's a spiral which is constantly posing danger because the spiral form is constantly getting out of control. And there are various ways in which you can get a crisis in this system. A blockage at any one of these points, anywhere in this process, gives you a crisis. And there is a tendency within Marxists to say there's only one form of crisis. What you immediately see from this is there are various places where you can get crises. It may be that there are not wants, needs, and desires. Everybody decides they don't like something and they're not going to deal with it. And so wants, needs, and desires can actually uh, be a source of a, of a crisis in this system. Failure to realize and, 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 and problems of realization and so on can be a crisis. There are problems of, uh, of the labor process. There are problems over uh, getting the money out of the distributional field and getting it flow back in reinvestment. There are all these sorts of things which exist. So the crises exist all over this place. And so I could sort of go through this in much more detail if you want, but you can see immediately that in a cyclical flow, you can't say this is the real point of crisis. Everything is potentially a poor point of crisis. And, you know, I had these arguments only two weeks ago in London with a whole bunch of people who are into the falling rate of profit. They say there's only one form of crisis that matters, and that's the falling rate of profit. And I kind of say, well, that's like saying there's only one way you can die, and that's because your heart stops. It means, <laughs> you know, and, and, and sure enough, but on the other hand, the cause of death can be your liver failed you or your, or, or, or your stomach gave out or something like that. I mean, in other words, uh, we have to think about this as being, multi, you know, as a, as a systemic process. And anything that interrupts the flow, and Marx becomes very, very concerned about the flow. So it's a spiral form. It's growing. How does it grow? It has to expand both uh, sort of in intensity but also in extensive. So it's expansionary ge geographically. And so we get kind of a theory of, a, of, of geographical expansion. And I think this is a very important argument about Marx's capital because 
the capitalist mode of production when Marx was writing dominated only in a very small corner of the world. It was basically Britain, Western Europe, and the eastern seaboard of the United States. But the capitalist mode of production dominates everywhere now. So actually, Marx's analysis of, of capital is more significant now than it was way back there. And the question is, how do you keep the spiral form going? How do you keep accumulation going at a compounding rate from here on out you know, when you're looking at everything that's been going on in China, everything that's been going on in, you know, in, 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 in India, as well as uh, you know, in the traditional centers of, of capital accumulation. So uh, this, is, this is one point, the spiral form. The other thing is the speed with which this moves is terribly important. Marx points out you get a crisis not because something gets blocked, but because it doesn't get sold in time. So the temporality of this becomes significant. And actually what you see historically is the temporality is speeding up. It's going faster, much faster. And if you look at the speed of movement in the kind of financial markets, you see, kind of, is it nanoseconds or even smaller than, smaller than that? And this speed up becomes absolutely central. So you have to actually speed up all the elements within this system, the distributional structures, and speed up realization. So the world of consumerism then gets caught up. How do you speed up consumerism? Well, you produce goods which are either instantaneously obsolete, like, you know, the next phone thing, or you, you produce goods that fall apart. If you, if you produce goods that last 150 years, then, then, then you know, capitalism's dead. It's gone. I mean, there's no way you know, it could last. I, I, I'm, I'm very anti-capitalist in my behavior. I still use my grandmother's forks. And, and, and if you do that, then you know, who's going to make forks if everybody uses your grandmother's forks? You know, and there's no market in forks. So, 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 so making markets up there, but that also comes back to something which uh, is very important, which is the creation of a lifestyle. And one of the ways in which one's needs and desires are set up is by the creation of whole new lifestyles. And my favorite example is suburbanization in the United States after 1945, the creation of a whole new lifestyle. What did it want? Well, it created a demand for, for cars, it could demand for you know, all, all kinds of uh, household technologies. Uh, you know, my favorite thing is a, a huge demand for lawnmowers. And, and, and uh, where did that come from? As if somehow or other, you know, but this, the creation of a, of a lifestyle is, 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 is absolutely critical to the way in which capitalism works. Now, I'm concentrating on this, this, this cyclical kind of process, which in some ways is what uh, Nancy is referring to when she's talking about the foreground versus the background, or the, you know, and, and, and I share entirely the view that you cannot examine capitalism simply by reducing capitalism to capital. That is not what you can do. If you want to understand capitalism, you've got to understand the context in which this circulation process operates, what it affects, and how it works. So when I kind of say one of the ways in which it solved the wants, needs, and desires problems after 1945 was suburbanization, well, what does that entail? It entails transformations of social relations, uh, environments, and, and, and all the rest of it, lousy land use practices, and, and the like which gets you then to what I would call contextual conditions that Marx did mention and say, basically, I'm not dealing with them. And he's very clear about this. And I have no problem with Marx saying, OK, I'm not dealing with it. Because if he says that, you know, you, you know very clearly, I have problems with Marxists who don't actually recognize that he's made these assumptions. And that when you drop the assumptions, the world looks rather different. For instance, something that's very, you know, very close to what Nancy's been working on and many other people is the whole kind of question of social reproduction, the reproduction of labor power and the like. Marx gets to it and says, I'm not dealing with it. It's not as if he says it's unimportant. He says, I'm not dealing with it because I'm, you know, my theory of capital is, it says that capital doesn't really care about that. Capital basically says to the worker, go ahead and do whatever you want and just make sure that you come back to work next day and we'll give you the money for the wage and that's it. So Marx is kind of saying, in a sense, I'm trying to reconstruct what capital cares about and what capital does, and capital doesn't care about social reproduction, except that it, it takes what is there and, and appropriates it, and appropriates it as a free good. And actually, Marx starts to talk about the free gifts of nature. Free gifts of nature are very important in his analysis. He says they're there and they're vital for, for, the, for the survival of capitalism, but I'm not going to deal with that here. The metabolic relation to nature, he talks about and says, well, it's a significant thing, and, but I'm not going to deal with that here. 
and similarly about the, the production, reproduction, and destruction of human nature and culture, that suburbanization meant a, a transformation of human character, a transformation of human wants, uh, needs, and desires. And, and therefore, there is a perpetual kind of process of this kind, but again, Marx says, I'm not dealing with that. And, and again, I have no problem with him saying that. I have a problem with, with kind of saying, well, therefore it doesn't matter, or it's secondary, or it's irrelevant, or, or something of that kind, which I really don't uh, think is the case. So when you start to look at the contextual conditions, you see a number of areas. The reproduction of labor power. Marx doesn't deal with that. He doesn't deal with the free gifts of human nature except to say, you know, we have to understand the, 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 the knowledge, the, the talents and so on that are in the, the culture, of, uh, get transmitted culturally uh, within uh, the working class and others also. Uh, the same thing about production, reproduction and destruction of space, place and nature. Uh, this is a, an area where Marx again talks about this as being significant but doesn't get into it in great detail except in one regard. Uh, in my own work, I've been very interested in urbanization and very interested in you know, fixed capital investment in the built environment, the transformation of uh, nature, uh, as Marx talks about it, to second nature. Second nature is that nature which has come to us uh, through human modification. And the human modification of that world, so it produces, you know, fields which are already sort of cleared, uh, cities and, 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 and the like, that takes investment. So money has to be diverted from this circulation process into another circulation process, which is going to create the built environment, the roads and highways and the houses and, and, and all the rest of it. And, and, and a lot of this is about, of course, the construction of place and space and all the rest of it. So, that, so that these contextual conditions are absolutely vital uh, for understanding uh, capitalism and, 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 and therefore, but we've got to understand that that is not what Marx is dealing with. What Marx is dealing with is, is, is capital. Now, there are a number of things that come out of the study of capital and I think it's, well, this is the, one of the points I would want to make. Um, I'm perfectly happy with saying, okay, look, there are crises of environment, there are crises of social reproduction and, and, and but what Marx does is to say, this driving engine of capital accumulation is a spiral and it has certain rules of operation and those rules of operation are such as to have to be uh, acknowledged, have to be obeyed if capital is going to get reproduced as a social system. And once you know the laws of motion and you have some ideas, then you know some of the pressures which exist on society. For example, I've mentioned already the idea that this is a spiral form because you have to produce surplus value. You have to produce more at the end of the day than you had at the beginning of the day. You have to do it on a continuous kind of basis and a faster and faster basis. And what that says is the law of motion is such that it means accumulation for accumulation's sake, as Marx puts it. It means that this system has to keep on growing, 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 and therefore there is a growth question. And the growth question was not significant in when Marx was writing. My main thing now is it's an incredibly important question. There are certain limits that can, about growth. So the question of the stability of this system arises partly out of that. Now, one of the things here is that if you want to compound growth, capital can take various forms. It can be the money form, it can be commodity form, it can be production activity. So it takes those three different forms. Which form can expand without limit? Well, it's the money form, actually. And at the, uh, you know, the, 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 there was a very important moment in capital's history when it abandoned a material base for the financial system, which was August the 15th, 1971, when the US went off the gold standard. After that, what could you do? You could just add zeros to the money supply anytime you want. You can start playing games with, with, the, with the money supply. And the result of that has been that there's been a great shift in the dynamism and, and of this system. In volume one of Capital, the driving force is the individual entrepreneur looking for profit. That's volume one. Volume two, about realization. Well, you've got to manipulate consumer demand. How do you do that? Well, it turns out, you know, when there was real problems of manipulating consumer demand, like in the 1930s, then you have to come up with a way of creating demand, and who does that? The state. 
So suddenly you find the state becomes a driver. It, it drives the demand. It, 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 it subsidizes the building of the suburbs. The building of the suburbs go on, and then all the demand that flowed from that then flows back into the economy. So a driving force then becomes the state. But where does the state get the money from? If it lies only on taxes, it, it couldn't do it. So what does it have to do? It has to go to the bankers and say, give me some money. Where do the bankers get it from? They can invent it. They can invent it, and they do. And they invent money and actually come back in this kind of way. So that's the second driving force. So the third driving force lies over in the field of distribution. And I would like to argue, and this is that financialization was essentially a recognition that the driving force of the state was no longer significant and, and no longer able to stabilize this system. And the driving force had to be relocated within the financial apparatus because otherwise the system would have fallen apart. And the great thing about you know, this is that if, if money has a, a metal base, then there's a restriction. Uh, and Marx talks about this restriction and says, you know, every speculator in the world wants to sort of get out of the, uh, the uh, monetary constraints, but he says they break their head on, on it because you cannot get out. You can never abandon the metallic base, says Marx. He was dead wrong. It got abandoned. And what happened? Well, in that case, you simply add zeros to the world's money supply. And you keep on adding zeros, and you can add more zeros, and that's what quantitative easing is. That's what a lot of the things that go on. At the same time, there are also the ways in which life gets connected to actually being over there in the distribution field and forcing your way down through production to try to create more value through production. I'll give you an example. I have a pension fund. Pension funds are all over in that distribution field. What do they do? They just don't sit there with their money. They go out there and say, we need, we need to get a rate of return on this. And they have a fiduciary obligation to get the highest rate of return. And if the highest rate of return means that you actually employ labor in all kinds of awful ways, then that's the way you do it. So I end up with, you know, I'm in TIAA CREF, and I find it's doing all sorts of horrible things, you know. And uh, so, so, so there's a huge pressure that comes from that area to find and, and actually what this is, is the use of what I call anti-value or debt finance to push this system. Debt is a claim on future value. And in fact, you saddle the whole thing with debt and that replicates the system because we've now got to pay off all that debt. I mean, as students, if you've got student loan, you know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, this has is, this is been going on in all areas of our life. In fact, What's happened is that the power for, of, of this system now resides entirely in the distributive field. It lies in what I would call a state finance nexus, which is the nexus of banks, uh, so central bank plus, uh, plus the treasury. It, this, is, this is where the, 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 the real power of this system lies, backed by, of course, all the pension funds and all, everybody who needs to get some, some extra money out of financial operations. And this leads into all kinds of other ways in which money can be got. It leads to the possibility of a huge amount of dispossession of populations uh, by, by, in a sense, thievery. The sort of thing that George Soros did when he bet against the, uh, the, the value of the pound in 1992. And in seven days, he made a billion dollars, something of that kind. Seven days. Now, why would you bother to go to work if you could make, you know, I'd mention this to students, and I'd say, how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, this, is, this could only happen if you don't have a monetary base if you, of, 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 of the gold, uh, and, and, and you can allow these kinds of, this kind of stuff to, 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 to go on. So you get a lot of thievery and robbery, uh, which is going on through the financial system. It's legal. Soros didn't do anything illegal when, when, when he got a, 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 a billion dollars. But, but who lost the billion dollars? Well, the British public lost a billion dollars. So this is stealing from one bunch of people by financial manipulation. And the other side of this is that we're increasingly lost in what I would call debt peonage. So one of the ways in which this system starts to operate is, is the debt. It's debt driven and becomes very significant. Now, final, final point here. Where is their struggle in this system? I've mentioned crises can break out all over. My answer is struggle can occur all over the place. The classic Marxist question is, okay, struggle over 
value and surplus value, production, valorization in production. And that's a class struggle between capital and labor. And you know, we know a lot about that, and there's a long history of thinking about that. So, that, okay, that's one point of struggle. What kind of struggles occur about realization? Actually, these turn out to be very important for a number of reasons. First reason is that uh, you can appropriate value at the point of realization. You don't make value, but you can appropriate it there. Um, give you an example. That guy who took over a pharmaceutical company and, and, and turned the $7 pill into a $750 pill. That's at the point of realization. That's extracting value at the point of realization without doing anything. And, and so you start to look and you see at the point of realization there's a lot of extraction of value going on. And then that contradictory unity between production and, un and, and, and realization becomes significant because value can be produced in one place and realized somewhere else. My Mac computer is made in, in uh, Shenzhen, Foxconn gets uh, only about a 3% rate of return on its capital. Apple sells the computer in the United States and gets something like a 27% rate of return. So actually, the value is produced in China and realized in the United States. And it's realized in a way where there's not only is a tran geographical transfer of value, and that's going on all the time through these kinds of mechanisms, but that actually the place of realization then becomes much more significant. Walmart for example, organizes all of those producers in China and elsewhere. IKEA does the same, and they, 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 they get the value which is produced in all those different parts of the world, and, and then they bring it and they realize it in, in the United States or Europe or wherever. So the relationship between production and realization becomes very significant. And then there are struggles over this. Who struggles over that price of that of that pharmaceutical pill. I mean, who struggles? What kind of struggle is it? Actually, it turns out it's not capital versus labor. It's buyers versus sellers. And Marx points to this and says, yeah, you will get struggles up there, but they're buyers in between sellers, and so I'm not quite as interested in that because I really like the class struggle stuff. But my argument is, well, no, you should be actually be concerned about the struggles that are going on over realization. And those struggles go on over things like wants, needs, and desires, and they spread back into the whole kind of question which exists there, what kind of human nature are we dealing with? And that is not an, an irrelevant question. I mean, one of the fortunate things, if you can call it that, from Donald Trump being president, is asking, what's a decent human being in this world? You know, and, and, and uh, you know, there's, 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 there's sort of issues arising uh, about our species being, our human nature, what is it? What does it mean? I mean, it's often put in this, what does it really mean to be an American? And, and is that the kind of person we are? You know, when we look at Donald Trump and all the kinds of stuff that he gets up to, you say, is that kind of person we want to be? You know, so there are, there are struggles going on all in the background of this, uh, of this, of this realization thing. The same thing that goes on in terms of the distribution. What kind of, what kind of struggles exist in the sphere of distribution? Well, there are the renters. Would anybody in Manhattan dispute the idea that there is a struggle to be had against developers and uh, landlords and uh, you know and those rack renters and so on? I mean, or, or would anybody deny that uh, the struggles to go on against the credit card companies and against the telephone companies and all these sorts of things? Well, there's lots of struggles going on over there. Some of it's intercapitalist. I mean, the landlords don't necessarily ap operate nicely for the industrialists and there are all kinds of conflict can, can come in that kind of area. But there's also this huge kind of question of who's managing and creating the debt. How do we struggle against the power of the Federal Reserve? How do we struggle against the power of the state finance nexus? And who does the struggling against that? You know, is this a class struggle in the ordinary sense or is it not? And that to me is a, again a rather Im, Im, important uh, kind, kind, of, kind of question. Because the power of that nexus is very, very, very significant. I always remember in the wake of the collapse of Lehman Brothers when nobody knew what to do and the whole car economy is tanking, um, you know, Congress all disappeared and you know, the president disappeared and went, went and hacked bushes or something like that. Well, you know, <laughs> did what, whatever he did. And, and, but the two people who came out and said, here's what we do, was Ben Bernanke and Hank Paulson, which is the chair of the Federal Reserve and, and the Treasury Secretary. And they came out with a three-page piece of paper and said, this is what we're going to do. 
This is how we're going to get out of it. That was, the, that, was, that was the state finance nexus being personified. Generally speaking, the state finance nexus stays in the background, doesn't want to be identified. But that was a moment where it came out front and said, yeah, Congress looked at the three pages and said, that's not long enough. We'll convert it into a 300-page document. And, and, and Bush came along and said, thanks very much. I think we've got this under control, you know, but, but, but in effect. So, so this is, but who's, who's going to deal with that? And when you see what that is doing, you look at something like what's happened to Greece, or what was happening to also to Puerto Rico, now made even, even worse, of course. But when you look at, at, at what's happening, you kind of say there's struggles to be fought there. There are struggles, of course, uh, over the free gifts of nature and, 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 and environmental struggles. There are struggles over hum, you know, human wants, needs, and desires. There are all these sorts of things. So this map is, if you like, a map of different kinds of struggles. But the struggles are organized differently. It's capital versus labor in production. It's buyers and sellers. It's users versus ab uh, abusers in, in, in the, the distribution field. And, and now... We have a kind of interesting sort of question. I'd be interested to see what Nancy would say to this. Do we, we either change the definition of class struggle and say, okay, it's all class struggle. It's just it's not the same it was before. Or we say, actually, we might want to identify between anti-capitalist struggles, which are all over the map, and class struggles, which have this much more narrower definition. I don't know which way to go, frankly. I mean, in, in a sense, it, it sort of doesn't matter. I think, though, it is important to understand the anti-capitalist nature of many of these other struggles. But it's clear that it's not all environmentalists are anti-capitalist. It's not, it's not that all feminists who are working on questions of social reproduction are anti-capitalist. It's not as if all gays are anti-capitalist. It's not as if, uh, you know, everybody... So the, the big question is, how do we organize or think about an anti-capitalist struggle which unites many of these elements and is careful in relationship to all of these different issues, which are absolutely significant, and I, I agree with Nancy on that 100% that they're, they're, they're vital to be interpreted, as we look at the whole kind of question of capitalism and what capitalism is about. But at the core, I still want to keep to Marx's notion that we should also recognize that we ought to deepen our understanding of the depth uh, of, of, of what capital is about. So I like that separation between capital and capitalism. I like Marx's theorization of capital uh, because it actually does uh, tell you in a very clear way what some of the real, real problems are uh, in, in the, the dynamic of capital itself. And it's like if that's the engine which is driving most of what we do, then if the engine conks out, then you know, we're in a real mess. That doesn't mean there can't be all kinds of struggles going on elsewhere, which are significant, and which could also block this, end up blocking this whole system. The relationship between reproduction, for example, and labor supply is a kind of a very kind of interesting sort of uh, uh, dialectical relation that needs, needs to be studied and looked at. So that's where I'm at, and I'd be interested to see how we proceed. Thank you. Okay, well, that was a really uh, interesting, uh, deep, and uh, thoughtful, uh, so many points. So I'm going to just off the cuff mention a few things that struck me. Um, first, of course, this uh, fundamental distinction that you've insisted on between capital and capitalism. And um, I'm not sure how, whether this is a third category or whether it's already in, in capitalism, but the phrase that I kept using was capitalist society. And um, the reason I want to insist on that is because of the, this question of institutional structure, sep these separations between economy and polity, for example, or production and reproduction. Um, to me, this is part of the sort of the guts of what a capitalist society is. As you know, these things have not been sharply distinguished in an institutional way in non-capitalist societies, in pre-capitalist societies, and some uh, socialist societies tried to liquidate the economy, polity, uh, 
separation in a, in a way that was quite problematic, perhaps. But anyway, so so I just want to sort of hear um, what you think about that um, third term of capitalist society is. Um, a second point um, is um, so what you a lot of, of, of the the things that I call the the background conditions your um, calling the, here the contextual conditions, the free gifts of nature, the free gifts of human nature, and I think with the public power element is sort of over on the distribution side over there. Um, and what I want to um, ask about that is whether, um, I mean, it seems to me that uh, capitalism only works at all if it can appropriate or expropriate those things as gifts, if not completely free, maybe it, it's paying a little bit here and there, but essentially by not paying the cost of reproducing those things. Um, and then, you know, we have all these environmental economists and, uh, and others and feminist economists who say, well, let's just internalize the costs that are being externalized. And I want to know, uh, David, what, what you think about that. My hunch is that capitalism cannot actually internalize these costs. And, that, um, and that's why I said that, I mean, this really gets to this question of production of value. Maybe this is really what the question is. You are assuming that value is produced at the point of commodity production, that it's uh, surplus value. Um, I think I'm inclined to say that well, wealth is transformed into value, and in that sense, value is produced also by this appropriation or expropriation in the form of free gift. So we may have a, a disagreement about whether all value really comes from commodity production or not. That's my second point. Um, I mean, I've thought, if that's right, then I've thought it would be very interesting to try to historicize what the relations between value produced in production and value expropriated from elsewhere are in capitalism. And uh, in, in, I would say in mercantile capitalism, the expropriation is a big, big deal, a lot bigger than value produced in factories. Whereas in what we call industrial capitalism in the 19th century, maybe they start to even out and maybe that's true as well in state-managed or social democratic capitalism. But today, don't you think that things are shifting again despite everything going on in China? There is such an enormous, you, this is what you mean by financialization, in, in value that is, um, I would say produced, you may not like the word produced, okay, uh, generated through uh, expropriation, whether it's by driving down wages, so, uh, destroying unions and, 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 uh, and so on, so that workers are, are no longer actually paid the average socially necessary cost of their reproduction, but have to you, use credit cards and you know mortgages and, and other things and student loans and and all the rest of it. Um, I mean, to me, that seems to be a big part of how accumulation works today. It's, it's, you're, I agree that, that the banks are just, you know, printing money and so on, but it's coming out of the hide of people. And the people that it's coming out of the hide of, I want to call the working class in an expanded sense. Not all of them are working in factories, and not all of them are even in the formal economy. Um, but, but, but this gets to your last point about how to think about class struggle and struggles, and this will be the last thing I say. Um, I think that the uh, notion of class struggle has been thought of too narrowly within what 
I have been calling traditional Marxism, and I'm not saying that's your Marxism. I mean, because of the focus of exploitation and the point of production and so on, um, I, I would say that propertyless people who um, are engaged in unwaged but socially indispensable activity in social reproduction or in maintaining the habitats, cultivating the resources that capital expropriates and funnels into the accumulate, that, that, that the struggles around expropriation, just to use a, a word there, or dispossession is your term, those are class struggles, even though they don't have, they're not at the point of production. So, and, and to me, it would be very important politically to try to promulgate a, this broader view of class. I was struck in, in the US election season by the stark contrast between the way Donald Trump sort of projected an image of the working class. It was white, straight, male, Christian in mining, manufacturing, construction versus the sort of image projected by Bernie Sanders, which was of a, a working class that uh, was in the public sector, could be in domestic labor, could be in um, retail, in, um, in, in, in agriculture, and that was, could be black, brown, female, so the, to me, the, uh, the question would be how to think about um, pr pr promulgating that, that much more expansive view of what the working class is, what class struggle is, how exploitation and expropriation are intertwined and not separable, how capital links them and, and right, profits off of their nexus. Um, and, and I think this question of, of why struggles erupt at these boundaries that I described, and the, the boundary struggles are class struggles often in this expanded sense. Uh, but the, by calling the boundary struggles, I'm calling it attention to where they are. Anyway, that, that's an, another way of thinking about your last point about so, social struggle. So, David, a lot of ground was covered, but there's limits to the map. I was going to make a limits to capital kind of uh, joke there, but I didn't really execute. But imagine, <laughs> imagine I did. Um, you laugh, but, um, uh, but I'm going to hold you to five minutes to answer all that. Maybe actually four and a half, because I just took 30 seconds from me. <laughs> OK, okay. Um, one of the things uh, I, I'm, I have not been very good at is looking at the uh, institutional structure. So uh, I, will, I will seed whatever you want on that to you. <laughs> In terms of the division of labor, I'm not, I, I don't quite know how to sort of work with, uh, with, with some of that. So, but I, uh, you're right, I'm not uh, spending enough time here on the institutional structure, and I should spend more time in, in evaluating this. Uh, the question of, of value, wealth, and all the rest of it, I'm going to give a, 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 um, a, a sort of strict Marx uh, answer to that. The, the theory of value in Marx is not uh, his theory of value. It has no normative content. And y you, when you're writing, you're often very alert, I think, to questions of normative content of um, any of these conceptual apparatuses. But Marx, I think, really doesn't do that with the value theory. The value theory he presents to us is not his value theory, it's his reconstruction of how capital values things. And the answer is, it, it doesn't care about a lot of things. So a lot of the things that you and I might care about and think of as valuable in the, in, in the in ordinary sense of the word valuable, capital doesn't care about. Uh, capital, I mean, part of the story about does capital care about the health and well-being of the labor, for, labor force? The answer is no, it doesn't. Uh, it, 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 you know, if, if it's got a, a system uh, which, which means that uh, the labor force is going to have very low life expectancy, so what? You know, I mean, capital's not a moral uh, system as far as that's concerned. So Marx's notion of value then is, is 
And, and, and at one point or other, he says, uh, to, to, to be a valuable person in, uh, in capitalism is a misfortune. <laughs> and the question I raise in the book is, well, if it's a misfortune, why is it that so many people want to join the system? By saying, we, are, we want to join the value uh, chain and be valuable. In, but they don't obviously mean they want to be valuable in the Marx sense, of, of capital sense. They want an alternative idea of value. And I'm fine with that, but I think the, 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 the thing that has to be worked out, uh, not as a critique of Marx about value theory, but saying, all right, well, what is uh, the value that uh, we would like to see imported and utilized in, in the evaluation of uh, production? And this comes out in, other, in another sense, too, that one of the other points you're making is um, there's a big difference in Marx between price and value. Money, he says, and he's very clear about this, and I, I, I get sort of concerned that people don't understand this well enough. Money is a representation of value or an expression of value. And as such, it can betray value. And in fact, value, price frequently does betray value. And Marx talks about the contradictions which exist between value and price. And what, in effect, happened when you start to go off a, a, a price system which goes off a, a, a metallic base is that the price system starts to internalize uh, its own dynamic and it, it floats free from the value, in which point, at which point people say, well, what's the point of the value theory? The point of the value theory is to give you an, an anchor to critique what's happening in the price world. You know, I mean, um, conventional economics doesn't do this. It's abandoned the value theory, and as a result of that, it has no standard of critique of what's going on. And, 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 and Marx's value theory, which, which I can go into if anybody wants, but, I mean, is, is, is rather different from classical value theory. In fact, volume one of Capital is a fantastic uh, essay on value and what is or is not value. And it's not actually read that way. I mean, the first three chapters talk about value in the market. The rest of volume one of Capital is very much taken up with what, what Diane Elson calls uh, the value theory of labor. That is, what does labor have to experience in order uh, to obey the rules of value which have been set up in the market? And the answer is, of course, that, you know, everything you read in the working day, which is disastrous, what you read in about division of labor and how that gets reorganized and everything. So, so, so Marx has, has a, a, a value theory, which is not the same as the labor theory of value. If you like, capital has two parts. The first three chapters is about the labor theory of value, and the other chapters that follow are about the, the value theory of labor. And, and actually, Marx's value theory is the contradictory unity of those two elements and how they are constantly in tension and in battle with each other. Marx is a very dialectical thinker, thinker and he thinks about in those, in those terms. So I think that the value question is uh, uh, very important. And I, 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 I get into trouble because, you know, with, because I kind of say, no, uh, nature doesn't, as far as capital is concerned, nature does not contribute value. It's valueless. As far as, that's why it's called the free gifts. And the same is true of, uh, of social reproduction. They're free gifts. And, and, and capital doesn't value them and, and, and won't want to value them. It's only when society, and this is your coming back to your institutional structure, when society says that value theory can't, can't prevail in the way it is, we have to limit it in certain ways by limiting the length of the working day, by changing conditions in the factory labor and, 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 and assuring people have at least something to live on if they're unemployed, those kinds of questions, those, those are societal uh, kinds of questions which arise within <coughs> capitalism. But Capital's, capital's value theory is in, is, is, does have that narrow base. Final, final point. I, I'm inclined to, to take the, the last question in this way. I think uh, there are loads of anti-capitalist struggles around. And I would rather talk about anti-capitalist struggle. Because class struggle, in a way, is such a tainted term that I think it's, for, for reasons you've mentioned, that it's very difficult to have a and this is maybe going back to your Trotskyist past, you know, that, <laughs> that if you mention class struggle, everybody says, yeah, well, the workers, you know. Uh, uh, so so, so I, uh, in order to avoid that, I tend to kind of say, okay, look, class struggle is rules at the point of production. 
class appro appropriations exist at, at the point of realization. Class uh, configurations of liabilities go on in the distributional field, but I still think production is, 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 is significant in, those, in, that, in that way. So um, we're going to take a few questions. So if you could line up at either microphone, um, uh, we can start taking questions. I have two very quick things I'll just pose that may or may not be answered. I guess one would be just the question of, uh, you know, Marxists for 150 uh, plus years have been focusing primarily on capitalist crisis and explaining the different types of capitalist uh, crisis. Um, it seems to me there might should be more work done on capitalist stability and the way in which even if this system is unstable, workers have a vested interest in maintaining its, its stability. So if you look at capitalism, it's a remarkable period where, um, you know, worker disruption and struggle um, in any serious sense is more the exception um, than the rule because it rooted in this, you know, dependency between capital and labor. And the last point on, um, on Nancy's comment was that I completely agree that there should be this expansive view of the um, of the working uh, class to include people doing unwaged work um, and so on. But I think that still goes back to the question of the importance of talking about the point of production because of where the particular social weight of workers are. And even if today we have this broader, uh, correct conception, broader conception of the working class, it still might be that there's um, you know, 100,000 workers whose social weight is equal to that of 10 million workers. Not in any moral sense, but just in the ability of, let's say, a small number of uh, nurses, people engaged in logistics, and still longshore workers and so on um, to disrupt. And then from the level of political strategy as opposed to analysis, it seems to me that point of production is actually, uh, might be neglected um, today. Um, so we'll start uh, one on the left, uh, and we'll keep you to um, a minute. Okay, hey, thanks. Uh, the most sort of compelling uh, vision I've seen for like a future of socialism is uh, very generally like a nationwide leisure class. Uh, do you think something like that is possible without subjectifying people across the ocean? Yep, uh, on the right. Hi, uh, yeah, uh, my name is Andres. I'm a doctoral student at the New School. Uh, my, my question is about uh, the realization of value and distribution and kind of how it relates to Nancy's idea of public power. Um, some heterodox economists have, uh, particularly in money, modern money theory, have challenged the idea that money is in after the, uh, uh, when we transfer it to a fiat system after the gold standard, that money is coming from banks or the private sector that this kind of notion that money grows off rich people and um, arguing that it's still the state that is issuing money and currency in our society. And, and so um, one of the things that they're arguing is that this belief, it's what's limiting our, real, our ability to use money for public purpose and kind of redraw those boundaries of what money can be for. Um, so my question is on, on your thoughts on, on that, on, you know, whether money could be used for other, other purposes. Yep. Um, and on the left. Um, I want to uh, address uh, particularly David with uh, respect to the state finance nexus that you were talking about. Um, first question is um, whether you see anything interesting or significant about the development of cryptocurrencies in connection with all of this, which are aiming precisely to avoid the presence of the state in trans monetary transactions. And then um, secondly, a number of uh, big uh, money people are talking about how the way out of the inevitable coming crash that they are all waiting for is for the state to confiscate the savings and the pensions and so on of the entire population in order to pay that off. Just wonder if you have a thought on that. So um, we'll go back to them for two minutes each, and then we'll finish with the last four um, questions. Um, so if you, Nancy, if you want to go ahead for two minutes. Sure. Um, well, I actually want to um, reply first to um, your own, uh, for your first couple of points. Um, I, I, I see the history of capitalism as a, a sort of set of punctuated equilibria where there are relations, well, there are regimes, that are more or less uh, stabilized things uh, pr provisionally until they don't work anymore and then you get a, an outbreak of, uh, of, of uh, crises all over the place. And 
I, my idea is that the, the restabilizations that arise have to do with reconfigurations of that, those boundaries of that institutional structure, whether it's market state or production, reproduction, whatever. Uh, anyway, I think we are in a period of crisis now where uh, the neoliberalization and financialization thing has um, just sort of let loose the um, the processes of consuming the, the system's own background conditions, the tiger eating its tail. Um, on the question about factories, if not, uh, not just the point of production, but the primary point of disruption, um, I, that really depends. I'm sure that's the case in China. Uh, in the US, it might be that these new mega uh, distribution centers are, would be a, a major point of disruption. And all over Latin America, people get a lot of mileage just by blocking traffic on major highways. Uh, and they're not workers there at all. So, I mean, I think the possibilities for disruption are um, multiple. The real question is, um, wh when do, do the broad mass of people see these things as just annoying and, uh, you know, disruptive rather than emancipatory and speaking for them? Uh, I think that's a, a more uh, serious uh, question. Um, I think the question that was raised about um, can we imagine sort of broad uh, emancipatory and, and progressive national class struggles in a way that are not um, even, if not explicitly, crypto anti-others? I think that's a really important question and it should go without saying that so, some form of internationalism is absolutely uh, on the agenda and um, I mean, a first step is, is obviously to stop scapegoating immigrants uh, who are, from what I can see, I'll let the economists say more about it, are not responsible for driving down the wages of American workers. Um, but the, the, I think these are things that have to be, um, these are alliances that have to be constructed politically by disseminating uh, other interpretations about the about global capital and global finance um, that show it's the same strategy as with the expanded working class within one country, showing that there is a, a larger nexus that is fattening the one percent off of all of us, and our only hope is to band together against it. I'll leave it at that. Um, on the, the leisure question, Marx's uh, view of socialism was heavily uh, towards the idea that free time was uh, the kind of uh, indicator of a successful socialist uh, world. Um, what's, what's interesting is we have all, all kinds of labor-saving, time-saving devices around us in our own society, but one of the things it becomes very clear is that most people don't have much free time and that we're going exactly the opposite direction. The technology is about you know, time saving and uh, actually everything speeds up so that we have to move faster. So, so um, I think that the paying attention to, to uh, that angle of what uh, socialist society should be about is to me very uh, important and whether, um, you know, the, the whole kind of question, well, two, two questions about the, uh, the cryptocurrencies and also about the uses of, uses of money. Uh, you know, the representation of value is very much in question right now. And one of the things I would want to say is that there is no such thing as a good idea that capital hasn't figured out a way to co-opt. And so you'll find these ideas about local monies and, uh, of course, uh, Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies and things of that kind, which seem to have or are thought to have emancipatory possibilities, which then get seized upon by power structures and utilized in a non-democratic uh, non uh, way, which, by the way, again, is something that Nancy talks about in the book a lot, with questions of democracy, which we haven't discussed here, but I think is 
are, are, are important. Um, I'm actually uh, pointed out myself that <clears throat> actually if we wanted to relieve the debt peonage that exists in society, one of the things we would have to do is to abolish pension funds. Now this sounds weird, but the problem is that the pension funds right now are wrapped up in uh, actually pressuring uh, the capitalist system to respond to giving a rate of return. And I find that uh, TIA Cref has been involved in land grab activities in Africa and things like that. It's, it's, it's this loop and it's going out to people saying, we've got money, you, you go out there and use it. The pension fund in California funded a hedge fund to take over a, low, a huge sort of housing complex which the hedge fund then starts to evict uh, some of the low income population that's there and turn it into high value kind of uh, renters. Some of the people that are evicted are actually pensioners who draw their funding. So in a sense, well, look, at, look at that mad system that you have to be evicted from your house in order to maintain your pension. I mean, this is the kind of insanity of this whole, uh, this, 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 this whole economic system, which is why I call the book The Madness of Economic Reason, because again and again you find crazy things like this. And, and I think that, but, but getting rid of the pension funds would mean that, well, then the question would be, would be how, how do we provide the, for the security of a population where there's no pensions? Well, Social Security is not a pension fund. Social Security is a pay-as-you-go system. You turn, convert everything into a pay-as-you-go system. In other words, you expand social security structures and, 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 and pay through, through taxes so everybody has a decent kind of uh, standard of living through, through uh, when, they, when they retire through that, that, that means, in which case you'd abolish private pension funds. And, and I don't think that's a, a bad idea. But, as uh, Catherine kind of mentioned, some people think about this and say, oh, yeah, well, okay, uh, you know, we capitalists, we can do that, and we can take all the money out of it. So, again, be careful. I guess I have to be careful what I wish for uh, because the capitalists probably figure out a way to actually turn it to their own advantage. And there, I think, also, there is a, an interesting kind of question. We talk a lot about the definition of the cl classes. I don't have too much problem with defining the capitalist class right now. I know who the thieving bastards are, and we're going to get them, you know. <laughs> so, so I, I, and I think actually, that's why I think anti-capitalism is, is, is a more robust kind of way of thinking about things, because it's everybody who's being screwed by, by, by those, those people. And there aren't that many of them. And if you take, you take the 100 top corporations, and you take the 100 wealthiest families in the world, and you've probably got about, I don't know, a third half of the wealth of the world uh, there, and they want more. I mean, that's the amazing thing. They want more. What, you know, this is, this, is what, this is what we're struggling with. Um, on the, the right, Patrick. Hi, thank you both for really thoughtful presentations. Um, my question is for Nancy. Um, in your sort of tripartite um, model that you have of social reproduction and polity and environment, you talked about how thinking of capitalism and capitalist society in these terms could bring in feminism, post-colonial Post colonial and critical race theory and political ecology. And I'm interested that that middle term wasn't political science. It was the, the, the models that are usually used for talking about imperialism and racial capitalism. And so my question is like, where does imperialism fit within this? Um, I could see it fitting across all three of your categories. Um, and, or, or is it, you know, is it just the overall model? Because I can see the sort of uh, influence of Rosa Luxemburg and what you're talking about in terms of capitalism eating its outside. So what are your thoughts on that without falling back into some very crude Maoism or <laughs> that kind of model of imperialism? Uh, before I forget, there's actually going to be a reception uh, 6112 uh, on the sixth floor. There'll be wine, I imagine maybe a tasteful assortment of cheese, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, but we could <laughs> go there and find out. Um, you on the left. Oh, uh, hi, thank you for the discussion. Uh, I have questions that, uh, so there is a new term, perception, uh, which uh, referring to uh, like uh, People nowadays can be pr producer and uh, consumers at the same time, uh, which uh, shows a lot in the uh, social media, uh, digital platform like uh, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, uh, you guys m mentioned a lot in China. China has really big uh, digital in pl uh, platform like 
Taobao and uh, Jingdong, so where uh, the massive uh, consumption behavior happens there. So what do you think of this theory and what do you think, th will this change social structure? That's the question. On the, on the right. Hi. Yes, I think that, uh, of course, the importance of uh, social, uh, the question of social reproduction is very important today. But I think uh, celebrating 150 years of capital, um, my understanding is that uh, Marx conceptualized labor uh, as a concrete abstraction and uh, modified by the ways in which the, con the, um, the form of property was modified uh, in that particular system. And in that sense, uh, all social relations became mediated by the commodity form. So, and that includes production and reproduction. Uh, and so that's what he is doing at the beginning of uh, volume one of Capital is uh, conceptualizing labor in that way as a concrete abstraction from a dialectical perspective. And then at the end of the book, uh, when he describes the primitive accumulation, uh, he describes uh, three phases of um, the enclosures and then uh, colonialism and the bloody laws uh, of forced labor. So in a way, when he's talking about free labor, he's being sarcastic in a way he's saying that is no such thing as free labor in capitalism. And he was describing all forms of slave labor together with forced wage labor. So I think this is an in interesting um, maybe way to rethink how we can um, utilize those concepts perhaps to look at production and reproduction at the same time. So I'd like to ask your uh, view on that. Uh, and I'm sorry, the final questions on the, the right. I'm sorry. Gabe Seven in the World Series. Yeah, my, my question um, is for David Harvey, and it sort of uh, follows um, on that question. I'm, I totally get uh, what you're doing uh, here, and I'm going to ask you a question to push it. Um, so why is this not a model of the economy? Why is this not? Because I don't think this is a model of the economy. And uh, I've always called myself a Marxist based on volume one. And if you ask me, well, why are you a Marxist? Why isn't, why are you just talking? Why is Marxism not just about the economy? I could always answer that because I would say it's about the relationship between capital and labor and about how capital organizes uh, labor and so forth. I'm an historian and I could always point to the rise of the bourgeoisie, the bourgeois state, bourgeois domination, rise of the working class and so forth. So my question is, when you expand it in the way that you have, which I find very compelling and very important and very coherent, um, how then would you distinguish this for when you and then you say it's a it, it's a theory of capital well then how then would you distinguish that from an economic theory of capital how capital reproduces itself and so forth where's the dividing line that makes this actually a social and historical theory and not just an economic theory uh, David do you want to start for two three minutes oh. um, Okay, you'll you, you deal with the imperialism question, right? So, uh, <laughs> I will, yeah. I, I, have, I have some views on that, but that's another question. Uh, yeah, I, um, I know you I think that, I think that um, you know, there, there is, the, the, the speeding up of a lot of this is, is, is creating all kinds of uh, strange compressions. And I think uh, the idea of the prosumer, uh, which Alvin Toffler came about with some years ago is, 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 is becoming significant. More and more as consumers, we're actually having to produce our own, our own goods. I mean, you, we have to check ourselves out at the uh, supermarket. We have to check ourselves in at the airport. We find ourselves having to do more and more things. We get less and less service for anything. And, uh, you know, we, we find ourselves being put in the position of a prosumer. This is, you know, when you come up with a schema like this, immediately people will ask all kinds of questions about it, including the, the, the last one. But, and, but one of them will always be, well, what, what happens when these things merge? When, when, when the contradictory unity between production and realization sort of just collapses? And what happens when 
when people don't even bother, when they reverse, and instead of it being the, 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 the real subsumption, you go back into a formal subsumption into the labor process in the way that Google does, that we actually produce a lot of the information which Google then uh, uh, gains and, and rents out. So they become rentiers. They move for distributional kind of position. So there's a lot of things happening in contemporary capitalism of, of that sort, which are a consequence of uh, speed up and a consequence of... Uh, but again, I would say they're consequences of something. I think, for example, going off the gold standard was not an accident, and it wasn't just it was wasn't contingent. It was a necessity at that moment of capitalist history. It had nowhere else to go, and it went there. And uh, with, with, with the consequences that have flowed ever since of all of this robbery that's going on, not only Soros but all of the robbery that goes on through structural adjustment programs visited upon, uh, you know, uh, poorer countries where they have to sort of sacrifice whatever value they have to uh, to, to to the money. To, to the money gods, um, I think that uh, uh, the last, the, the the whole kind of question of a concrete uh, abstraction, I, I, I didn't really mention this uh, very much, but Marx is is very clear that the one advantage that we have uh, as uh, investigators of social systems is the power of abstraction. We can't run controlled experiments, but we can. In, use abstraction. And so Marx is very clear that uh, the abstraction, how we create those abstractions is terribly important. Concrete labor and taking labor as a, a concrete commodity and so all of those concepts are set up so that they are sort of idealized material events. Marx's argument is it's material but he needs an idea. So the act of exchange for example is seen as an idealized uh, sort of a material event from which he then derives all the forms of value which then come much later. So, yeah, he's doing all this kind of thing and he's not talking, either he's talking about a logical way of trying to dis dismember uh, the actual dynamics of what capital is about. Now, uh, this brings me to the last kind of question as to what makes this, I'm not sure whether this is or is not an economic theory, I'm not you know, terribly concerned about that, I want to try to figure out how to understand capital. Um, I would suggest, however, that the volume one-itis is a problem. That actually, don't you think, it's just as important to look at the whole history of the creation of wants, needs, and desires? Don't you think that's as significant as uh, the history of what uh, the, the working class uh, is about? I'm not saying the history of working class is irrelevant, it's terribly relevant, but then the question of arising, which arises and has arisen since Marx, of how do you buy off a significant element of that working class through consumerism. And why is it that the concept that Marx does advance right at the end of volume two of rational consumption, which is consumption which is rational from the standpoint of capital, not from the standpoint of workers, but compensatory consumerism then becomes absolutely vital. And we actually now live in a society where those kinds of questions become really upfront. And if we don't put them up front, then we miss out on, on interpreting many of the things around us. Look at most of the movements that have occurred over the last 15, 20 years. I mean, the, the sort of anti-globalization movement about, what was that about? What was Seattle about? Uh, was it about the working class or was it about living conditions and forms of life and, 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 and all those broader, broader questions? And, and, and what was Gezi Park about? What was the eruption in Brazil uh, in, in uh, sort of June of uh, 2013 about? It wasn't about working class kind of questions in the classical sense. It was about the trials of trying to live daily life under conditions of, 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 of appalling, uh, you know, a mess of, 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 of what urban life is about. A lot of urban struggles are going on right now which are about the politics of daily life. And I think the politics of daily life is just as important as the politics of what goes on in the point of production. All I want to do is not displace, you know, the, 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 the familiar Marxist story about what goes on in the point of production, but to say there are other issues here, and I share with Nancy very much, this has to be done. Because otherwise we're not going to be able to speak uh, to, to people about the questions that are really bugging them, uh, you know, uh, and, and I think that this is uh, this is uh, an alternative history. Then has to be written, 
about, about uh, and, and actually the cultural historians have got around to some of this, I think, doing some very good work on, you know, consumerist practices in the 18th century, um, some of the things that went, uh, that, 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 were, that were built into uh, the rise of the capitalist form. So I, I think that the, the case is very strong, and I think that actually I'm not going beyond Marx in this, because I'm simply echoing what Marx said, that he was, thought was important, but he was not dealing with it here. And when he says that, it means that you should go look at it and, uh, at some point or other. It's an invitation. And it, doesn't, it doesn't end the story. It's an invitation to actually broaden the story. And I, and I think, actually, uh, my reading of Marx is it's full of those invitations to broaden the story. Uh, what I'm tired of is Marxists who actually want to narrow the, <laughs> narrow the story. And I think we both share a frustration about that that has happened to Marx. And I think, as you put it, that the withdrawal from Marx and from political economy for a number of years allowed many of these other questions to sort of bubble up and start to become so significant that it became impossible to ignore them. And, and now we can maybe in a position to put it back together in a more synthetic kind of way. Yeah, I just on that, that last point, I mean, we've gotten to the point where these two uh, very impressive biographies of Marx by Sperber and, and Stedman Jones are both argue that Marx is irrelevant, that, that oh, sorry, that, that he, it's, it's, it's only of historical interest, precisely because of this sort of narrowed uh, interpretation. Um, I wanted to just make one comment, which I hope will address both the question about imperialism and the question about social reproduction. As I see them, they're um, both uh, closely related. Um, I see uh, um, Marx, and I think this is right, as um, um, being somewhat ironic, but also quite serious about talking about free labor. Um, it, it doesn't mean free of uh, susceptibility to coercion, uh, but it does mean uh, a free legal status and eventually citizenship, access to uh, uh, at least a limited uh, set of uh, liberal rights and the ability to call on state protection when those rights are violated. Now, um, what that means to me is that having once been expropriated through enclosures or other forms of dispossession, a certain segment, uh, especially of the sort of male majority nationality working classes, uh, achieved uh, this kind of legal status, but that they are a kind of the tip of an iceberg of a much broader mass of dependent and unfree and subordinated labor uh, that did not have that status. I think that's a large part of how I would understand imperialism uh, as either being under direct co colonial rule and, and therefore not having the status to, in, in a sense, to be viable, to be subject to expropriation not once and then you become a free worker, but again and again and again. I think this has a great deal to do with the color line and with the whole question of race. I would say that in the United States today, people of color remain expropriable and viable uh, in ways that uh, white people do not, although white people are increasingly expropriated through debt and subject to forms of debt peonage, if you like, as well. Um, and I think this has also uh, a lot to do with the ambiguous status of women within capitalist societies uh, throughout its history. So um, basically what I'm talking about is how the political and the economic intersect. You can be expropriated because, because you lack the political status that enables you to call on protection from expropriation and, and therefore be only exploited. I, that's how I understand race, imperialism, and in a more complicated way, even uh, aspects of gender fall there. Leave it at that. Uh, thank you all for, for coming, and especially, of course, to our speakers. Um,
And please do join us on the, uh, in the sixth floor at 6112. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, and there's also a book.